Bridget and the association for having me today. I realized when I looked at the program that I'm the only Ohio person on the first day, and I'm not sure why that is, but I think that's okay. Uh, so so it, it, that was pretty interesting, Nancy, to talk about all the different things that are going on. One of the things about our organization, and uh, most of you knew us as Ohio Legal Rights Service for a long time, and in October of 2012, at the request of first Governor Strickland and then Governor uh, Kasich, we moved our organization, our grants, and a, a lot of our people out of the state agency to a nonprofit. And since October 1st, 2012, we've been Disability Rights Ohio, and I have to say that on the whole, the change has been uh, amazingly liberating for us. Um, we are independent of the state in a way that we never were, as a, even as an independent commission, and our work is more vital, our work is more exciting, our interactions with our clients, are, uh, we are more nimble, uh, we are able to manage our cash better, lots of things about our grants that are more, uh, that are easily facilitated now. So, so we're very excited about that. One of the things you need to know about our organization is that we are a cross-disability organization. We do a lot of work in the DD system, but we also have uh, a large number of clients who have significant mental illness. We have a, a large number of clients who have other types of disabilities. Under the grants that we get and the money that we raise, we serve all people with disabilities in the state of Ohio, and we do that with a small staff. We have about 55 people. A couple of our folks are here today. Melissa Day and Adana Wilson-Baney are over in that corner. Any other, any other DRO staff here hiding in the back? We tend to hide in the back. Okay. So I'm told if I point this, it will work. Yay. So our mission is to advocate for the human, civil, and legal rights of people with disabilities in Ohio. We envision a society in which people with disabilities are full and equal members, enjoy the rights of and opportunities available to all people, are self-directed, makes decisions about where, how, and with whom they will live, learn, work, and play, have access to needed services and supports, and are free from abuse, neglect, exploitation, and discrimination. I'm gonna apologize at the beginning for the slides. They're very dense. Uh, a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is based in law or, or, or legal writing, so uh, I wanted to make sure that all that stuff's in there. I'm not gonna read them necessarily, and you certainly are gonna have access to them on the OACBDD, BDD, D, D, B, D, D website. Uh, Kim has assured me of that. So, The thing about being cross-disability is interesting because uh, we talk with folks in a lot of realms. And, and lately, because I'm old, people invite me to Washington and I get to talk to folks around the country now. Um, the, the, the business of working with people and the independent living movement and the independence movement, um, NICL, ADAPT, uh, National Federation for the Blind, they, they bring a vitality and a, and a real energy to the notion of client-directed. Um, you know, the, the saying, nothing about us without us. And, and what's been exciting for me over the last 20 years in this state is to see the growth of the self-advocate movement here and the, and the DD self-advocates moving into that model of, of a, vi a vision of advocacy. I was at the People First conference about a couple of months ago, and uh, they have a song they sing about nothing about us without us. It's a very exciting moment when they're all there and they're, they're, they're thrilled to be thinking about that level of independence. And, and, and part of that, so what's happening in, in our world, in this cross-disability world or, or disability studies world that we live in, is that the DD world is starting to get really moved by that. And that's happening in both policy, in studies, and in the law. So it's exciting to be there. Um, let's go ahead and get into the stuff and we'll... So I was asked to talk today essentially about Ohio's system, the work that we're doing around integration and community, and um, maybe to perpetuate some of the rumors that are going around the state that we're gonna shut down all the ICFSMR or DD, or that, um, let's see, what are the other rumors? Well, we'll come, they'll come back to me. Uh, we, they're, just, they're great rumors, I love every one of them, and I, I, whoever tells me about them, I say, yeah, that's it, that's what we're doing. Um, so, this notion of community and this notion of integration is, is sort of new to us, but, and we all think it started with the ADA, but it, it didn't. It actually started much broad, more broadly, and this is part of being engaged in the larger disability community. You get this stuff, uh, you pick up this stuff. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about community is actually from Eleanor Roosevelt, who was at that time 
trying very hard to get the Universal Declaration of Human Rights passed the convention from the United Nations, getting the United States to sign on to that. And it's a long quote, you'll, have, you'll be able to read it. Um, but the part I like is about neighborhood. Such, place, such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerted act, citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. So the notion of community, of integration, of rights being protected best in the neighborhood is, is not brand new. It's maybe new to some of us, but it's not brand new. Um, uh, Jacobus Tenbrook is a famous constitutional law scholar. The talk that I, that I call the talk to live in the world, and that's because he was the very first lawyer, constitutional scholar, to think about the law and how people with disabilities should be treated. The whole field of disability rights law really flows from an article that he wrote called To Live in the World about how people with disabilities should be integrated into the world. And this is, again, a long quote. Um, but when you take a second to look at it, it's about a right on such terms to the use of the streets, walks, roads, highways is a rock bottom minimum. The right to gain access to the world in which they have a right to, to live, sorry for the typo, must also include as the part of the same rock bottom minimum. The right to utilize the common thoroughfares by riding on common carriage, so on and so forth. This notion of integration, of living in the world, of living in the neighborhood, is not peculiar to developmental disability. It grows out of a much larger sense of human rights as reflected in the Roosevelt quote, and in disability law and rights thinking, going back to Tenbrook in 1966. We see this integrated into the law now in many ways. In the DD Act, the federal DD Act, the purposes stated by Congress, and I've highlighted a couple of them in red here, um, to live in homes and communities in which individuals can exercise their full rights and responsibilities as citizens, to achieve full integration and inclusion in society as an individual manner consistent with the unique strengths, resources, priorities, concerns, abilities, and capabilities of each individual. So as we talk about the CMS community regulations, and, and the theme I'm hoping, you never let the executive director recovering lawyer do the slides, okay? Just, that, that's a rule you should all take away. Uh, I was hoping to have tables in there, and by the end of the day yesterday, the tables weren't happening. But what I'm trying to, sh to point out, and I'll, I'll come back to this as we go along, are the consistency in the themes. That paragraph G is essentially what the CMS regulations are saying. How many years later? And of course, Title II with the Americans with Disabilities Act is, is, the, is the elephant in the room. It's what everybody talks about, the integration mandate. And that's actually in the, in the rules that the Justice Department promulgated, that um, public entities must administer services, programs, and activities in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of qualified individuals with disabilities. Uh, and that's actually reflective of regulations that were under Section 504 going all the way back to the 1970s. So uh, again, this is not a new idea. It's something that's been around for a long time. It's just now in the forefront. The other aspect of this, and this is work that I did when we did the Martin case. We started, the Martin case actually started, I don't know if any of you know this, Martin versus Strickland. Uh, that's Nancy Martin, not John Martin. Martin versus Strickland. Um, uh, was a case where we brought essentially a community integration case even be that was before the ADA was even passed. And we did that based on constitutional pr principles that were evolving in the courts at that time. Um, Youngberg versus Romeo was the lead case that said when a person is in an institution, the state puts a person in the institution that they have to provide them with minimally adequate training or habilitation. Um, there were a couple of dissents or concurrent opinions, and I'll talk more about how the court makes decisions in a minute when we get to Olmstead. Uh, Thomas S. versus Flaherty is a case out of Virginia, out of the Fourth Circuit, that extended that to say that if the person could be served in the community, then the, the state has to provide that community setting to them. That's the minimum training required. And based on Thomas S. and a couple of other cases around the country, people like me were going, let's say, let's get at this, let's get at all these people who are in institutions who don't need to be institutions, who could be served in the community, and let's file a lawsuit. So we filed Martin. Uh, and that was a class that involved all people within the state of Ohio with developmental disabilities who could be served in the community and were not being served. Um, 
There's a really good article, you'll, get, you'll have the link to that, The Evolution of Disability Rights Litigation by David Furliger, who's a leading lawyer in this area. Um, take a look at that if you want more weedy stuff. I'll try to stay out of the weeds as much as I can, it's hard for me. And my staff will tell you I footnote every conversation so that uh, they get used to it. So the, um, the Olmstead case is very famous. Everybody knows in this field should know Olmstead. I always like to turn it around because Olmstead was actually the guy who locked up Lois Curtis. He was the state official. The reason his name is first is because when you go to the US Supreme Court, uh, where I've had the, the great privilege to practice a few times, never argued a case, but done briefing and all of that. So uh, when you go to the court, the party going up gets to be first. And since they'd lost in the lower court, Olmstead, who was the commissioner um, of, of services in Georgia, has his name first. And so everybody talks about the Olmstead case, but I like to talk about Lois Curtis because she was the, pl the lead plaintiff, LC, and she was the person who was in the institution but didn't need to be institutionalized. And I think b being a plaintiff in a civil rights case is really brave because you're exposing all of your life and all of this to the scrutiny of the court and the, co the state's gonna come back in and say nasty stuff about you and how inadequate you are, how bad you are. And you know, you're not getting paid to do this. You know, you said uh, you wanted to do it because you, you had the courage to want to change things. Um, Nancy Martin, our plaintiff, was like that. She ended up in a nursing home because she was very sick. But even to the end of her life, she wanted to, A, she wanted to live in the community. She wanted to live in a, in a, in a home of her own. But she also knew that what she was doing was going to affect thousands and thousands of people and it ended up doing that. So Nancy was a very brave person and fought really hard in her life for herself, for her own, for her own dignity, but she also recognized that by doing the case, she was helping thousands of other people. Um, Lois Curtis is an interesting, she's gonna be in Cleveland by the way, in July I think it is, one of the independent living centers up there is gonna have a conference on Olmstead and Lois is gonna be there and I want you to go and I want you to buy her artwork, okay? She's a very successful artist now. Uh, she, she's a pretty amazing person. I'm gonna be there and a lot of our staff are gonna go, we're co-sponsoring the, the event. Uh, you can go to our website to, um, to find more about it, disabilityrightsohio.org. Um, so, so the Olmstead case is what everybody talks about, but it was actually a secondary case. It was one of the cases that came up through the system, the court system, after some advocates in Pennsylvania, Stephen Gold being one of them, uh, uh, had already laid the groundwork, primarily in a case called Helen L. versus, versus Didario. And that judge, uh, and I, I won't read the quotes to you, but the, essentially upheld the notion that the ADA was designed to prevent discrimination and recognized that the Congress had intended that segregating people when you gave them services was a form of discrimination that the ADA was intended to, to fix. So that those circuit courts, there's never been a court to rule on this that didn't agree with that, that, that undue segregation, unnecessary segregation of people in more integrated, more congregate care is, is not segregation. How is that for a bad sentence? Huh? Any English professors out there, you wanna grade that? That was terrible. If, if you put somebody in a segregated setting and they don't need to be there, that's discrimination that violates the ADA. So that's, that's the takeaway from Helen L. So Olmstead, I talked about Lois Curtis, and um, I'm now blanking on EW, I know her name, but I can't, I can't think of it. Um, they brought this case, they both had developmental disabilities and they both had psychiatric labels. Uh, as so often happens, when, as, as Nancy alluded to, that when people get frustrated and people are not happy with their lives, they have behavioral problems. And of course, once you have a behavioral problem, it's like those cable commercials, don't get cable. You know, uh, it's, once you have a behavioral problem, then you get a psychiatric label. So then you're dual diagnosed. So then you're on psychoactive medication. It's a down, downhill spiral. And if some of you may have been reading the, the um, dispatch series on guardianship in Ohio. It's pretty amazing. I was talking to the reporters the other day and um, you know, the, the folks that get in that box get there and can't get out uh, and they're on medication that they may or not really need um, and they're in a nursing home where they don't belong but they've got a guardian who's not accountable because he's got 400 other wards. Um, those are all really bad situations and the good news about the dispatch series, um, my friend Carla's standing up in the back, APSI does it so very well. They really do, they are a, they are a national leader in how they provide protective and guardianship services. 
And um, so we have a shining beacon for the state to look at if they want to know how to do it. But uh, it sounds like the attorney general or maybe, some, maybe the governor's office are going to take a look at this and try to, try to figure out how to do a better job at providing protective services. Um, see, there's a footnote. Okay, now we'll come back on to the, to the talk. Um, so they were in a state psychiatric hospital, actually, and uh, the legal aid office in Atlanta, which is a very aggressive civil rights-focused legal, right, legal services office, uh, brought this lawsuit. Now, one of the interesting things about it is it's not a class action. It was just these two women. And so the, technically, the ruling in the case only affected these two women. Uh, but of course, the ripple and the impact of that has been much broader. The Supreme Court accepted the case. The Supreme Court doesn't have to accept case. They only take cases usually where there's different rulings from different federal circuits. Um, in this case, there wasn't any split, so they must have thought this was a really critically important issue uh, to get at. It was the, one of, a case, almost the, uh, like I said, there was Helen L, and there was maybe one other case out of Maryland, and then there was the Olmstead case. And so there were very few cases, and, um, and this is how the Supreme Court decides cases. And those of us who practice at the court, justice watch. We want to know what each justice did and what they said and why they said it. And we want to know, are they still on the court or has somebody replaced them? And how's that justice likely to rule if something like this got back up there? So we broke it down into a table. Um, so the majority opinion, which is five votes, um, said that segregating someone unduly violates the, violates the ADA. It's discrimination in violation of the ADA. A uh, little small ball technical stuff, the fundamental alteration defense, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, uh, was talked about in a plurality. And a plurality means it's not a majority of the justices. So it was only four justices that did that. And we'll talk more about what they said in a minute because it's important for the Ohio circumstances, for what's going on in Ohio. Um, Justice Stevens, who's no longer at the court, uh, didn't feel that they should have even addressed that. That's, a, that's the technicality part. Now, interestingly, Justice Breyer concurred and talked about deferring to the judgment of professionals. And that's sort of a hangover from the constitutional stuff that you have to defer to the professional judgment of the state's experts and that kind of stuff. But he, there was only one voice that said that. Or, or Justice Kennedy joined him on that. Um, so then you got Justice Kennedy taking a more narrow view, saying you actually have to prove discrimination. Uh, you can't just say because they're segregated. You have to show that they would not be able to, if they were not a person with a disability, they would they would be getting these services in the community. Well, that's pretty easy to prove, actually. So, so that wasn't a big deal. And then you had Justice Thomas, Justice Rehnquist, Chief Justice Rehnquist, and Justice Scalia dissenting. Um, Justice Rehnquist is no longer with us. Uh, Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia dissent almost all the time, so that's not surprising. Um, and, and so uh, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts and Chief Justice Alito have joined, and they're probably pretty predictable votes in the no column, in the dissent column. Um, but um, Justice uh, Kagan and Justice Sotomayor are pretty predictable votes in the yes column. So, so when we look at the votes and what would happen if Olmstead got up there today, pretty, pretty clear you've got a majority that would make the same decision and maybe make a better decision given the experiences we've had with this case since then. Uh, so that's a little lawyer technical stuff. I thought I like the colors, you know, that, that gets it, keeps it a little interesting. So a majority of the court found, much as had happened in the Third Circus in, in Helen L, that institutional placement of persons who can handle and benefit from community settings perpetuates unwarranted assumptions that persons so isolated are incapable or unworthy of participating in community life. There's that word again, community. Um, confinement in an institution severely diminishes the everyday life activities of individuals, including family relations, social contacts, work options, equal independence, educational advancement, and cultural enrichment. Beginning to see some themes here? When you break it down? This is Justice Ginsburg's majority opinion. They, they, they cited the Congress's intent, which is something a court should look at when they're interpreting a statute. It's important to remember, this is just implementing the ADA. It's not some broad constitutional ruling. Congress could come back and change the ADA tomorrow if it wanted to. And, and say, oh no, we didn't mean community integration, but they haven't, and they've amended the law once since this decision. So that's important. We've talked about how broad the term is and what it means, and the Justice Department's regulation was given deference by the court. In other words, the Justice Department is the entity that is charged by law with coming up with regulations in this area and has specialized expertise. So the court said, 
the integration mandate, we're going to follow the integration man mandate. We're going to let that influence our decision. Here's the um, uh, fundamental alteration piece. I said there were four votes that talked about the, 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 you have to reasonably accommodate people. You have to not discriminate against people is a better way to say it. Uh, unless that would be a fundamental alteration of the state or local government's program. And only four judges voted on this, and they suggested that one way a state could show that, they, that, that, that uh, changing anything would be a fundamental alteration would to, if they had a comprehensive, effective working plan to place people in the community and a waiting list that moved at a reasonable pace, not controlled by the state's endeavors to keep its institutions fully populated. And that's four voices, and, and what's happened with that since then is that um, the Justice Department, I'll talk more about the Justice Department in just a second, um, they have said pretty much, we're not even gonna look at a fundamental alteration defense favorably unless you actually have a plan and you actually are moving your wait list. That's the minimum you have to do. Um, but in our Martin case, uh, we tried to get a summary judgment from ju the, the federal judge here in Ohio by saying Ohio, by proving that Ohio didn't have a comprehensive plan and by proving that the wait list didn't move at reasonable pace. And uh, the judge said that wasn't the only way the state could prove a fundamental alteration, so he said the case was going to go to trial, and we eventually settled it. So, so those pieces are important, but they're not exclusive. So here's the takeaway from Olmstead, the minimum that Olmstead stands for. Uh, the ADA prohibits segregation of people with disabilities in an institution if the person can demonstrate that she or he is a person with a disability as defined by the ADA, and that's now under the amendments much broader and easier to do. He or she wants to move, which was a factual element in the, in the Olmstead case. Uh, the state's professionals agree that he or she is qualified to move, and you've got to remember they were in state institutions, and in the, on the facts of that case, everyone agreed, including the state's professionals, that these people could be served in the community. So that was a factual element of Olmstead. And that creating, creation of the community placement is a reasonable modification of the state's programs. In other words, it's not a fundamental alteration. So I have to apologize. This is really <laughs> weird to be looking down at this screen. I keep, uh, keep expecting a, a rock band to show up or something. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so after Olmstead, Nobody was really clear. Everybody thought that the, somebody from the federal government was going to sweep down on the states and all the institutions were going to be closed and, and that the states wouldn't have time to plan. And that didn't really happen. Um, there were some CMS guidance, some Dear Medicaid director letters that came out that were pretty clear that Medicaid programs needed to move in the direction of integration. But a lot of states were already doing that. Uh, so um, the description of the current programs uh, really isn't that different from what, where we were at the time Olmstead was decided. But after um, the Obama administration was elected, um, th there was a renewed interest in Olmstead. And the Department of Justice, um, the uh, Civil Rights Division, which is where uh, all of the great activities around Brown versus Board and you know, Little Rock and all of those places, that was the Civil Rights Division that led that charge once the, the Supreme Court decided Brown versus Board of Education. Um, the, the Civil Rights Division took a particular interest in uh, Olmstead enforcement. And uh, Sam Bagenstoss, and I'll talk a little bit more about Sam in a minute, uh, was the deputy principal direct, deputy director for civil rights, and he brought his own take to this. Um, they went out and, you know, under the, the, the Justice Department has authority to enforce the uh, Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act, CRIPA. And so they go around to state developmental centers, state centers, and issue consent or do settlements and do litigation and have mostly consent orders around the conditions in those institutions. And these are based on the Constitution and the fact that people shouldn't be deprived of training and shouldn't be hurt, uh, abused, or neglected while they're in an institution. Um, one of the first things they did was um, partner with disability in, uh, organizations like mine uh, to work on cases that were already in the pipeline. Um, the other thing they did was look at some consent decrees they already had or were entering into and immediately turned them around from 
bettering the institution to making sure that people who didn't need to be in the institution got opportunities to move out. And Georgia was very hard fought litigation. There were two cases in a parallel, the US versus Georgia, and another case that was brought by private individuals that ended up in a very strong consent order that had not only uh, integrated residential services, but integrated employment services as an important component of that as they phased down their, their institutional beds. And that was under the DOJ. Uh, Texas, they had an existing consent decree that the state was in violation of, the state was getting ready to pour literally billions of dollars into their state institutions and the, the Department of Justice changed course and said, we don't want you to do that. We want you to get those people out and we want you to get those people into the, into the community. Uh, that, that was a, an interesting conversation, I'm sure. Um, DAI versus Patterson is a case out of New York and it's important to this discussion of community because of what happened in that case and I'll talk some more detail about that. Um, if you want to know what the Justice Department thinks about Olmstead. There's a 2011 document, a web page, and I encourage you to go there. They have some definitions there, and I'll cover some of that, but uh, you can link to that web page and get a more comprehensive view of what, what uh, the Justice Department thinks about Olmstead. They're very active. They're very active in the states. They are looking still at states that have large institutional populations. We talk on a pretty, probably uh, two or three times a month with some of the lawyers in justice uh, about what's going on here in Ohio. They're focused on nursing homes and elders and people with physical disabilities, and they're focused on employment. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So this is the Justice Department's website. The most integrated setting is defined as a setting that enables individuals with disabilities to interact with non-disabled persons to the fullest extent possible. Nothing new there. Here's where we get into some of this stuff. Remember I've said there's themes here that I wanted you to pay attention to. There will be a quiz before lunch. Nobody gets lunch unless they pass the quiz. But you can opt out of that because that's a much better decisional model. So thank you for that. Um, it reminds me of the Class Act, which was going to solve the long-term care problems for the, for the country. And it was where you could, as an empl employee, you would, uh, this was part of the, Ameri the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, and uh, you would have long-term long care insurance as part of your employment benefit, and you, didn't, you had to opt out if you didn't want it. And because they did studied Cass Sustein, uh, he was there at the time they drafted it, so he knew all about this. And uh, he knew that the opt-out meant that almost everybody would take it. And what happened was it ended up not being actuarially supportable, so uh, Sibelius and HHS pulled away from it, and Congress eventually uh, revoked it. So that was the, a, a really aggressive act on Congress's part and the administration's part to solve the long-term care issues and get it off of Medicaid, get private insurance into the mix. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it uh, was not, not going to be sustainable, so they, they withdrew it. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, we got a little time. Um, so this is the Justice Department's notion from their website. So that's got all the authority of a website. You know, Lincoln said if it's on the web, you have to believe it, right? So um, I saw that on a website. There, it's their notion about integrated surveys, settings. And it allows people to live, work, receive services in the greater community like individuals without disabilities. And you see that phraseology now starting to come in really strongly, like individuals without disabilities. And that's, that's Justice Kennedy. They're very smart at the Department of Justice. They're the smartest lawyers in the country that I've ever worked with. I, I can't believe how bright they are. Um, so here's Justice Kennedy, the lone vote that everybody wants to make sure they're paying attention to because he's the swing vote on so many cases. And he says, yeah, you can prove discrimination, but you've got to show that they're treated differently than people without disabilities. So what shows up on DOJ's website? Like individuals without disabilities. Very smart lawyering. Located in mainstream society, offer access to community activities and opportunities at times, frequencies, and with persons of an individual's choosing, afford individuals choice in their daily life activities, provide individuals with disabilities the opportunity to interact with non-disabled persons to the fullest extent possible. Scattered site housing with supported services are examples of integrated settings. Scattered site housing comes up in the DOJ stuff all the time. And some of the people they partner with, like the Bazelon Center in DC, are all about it. They've got the data, they've got the experts. If you bring an Olmstead case in this country, they're there to help. And they want to make sure that we're not doing campuses, that we're not doing uh, assisted living um, apartment buildings, which is what the seniors want to preserve. 
that Nancy was talking about, that was what held this rule up for so long, actually, was the elder, elder lobby got in and said, what are you going to do with all these people in apartments? And the CMS went, oh, we hadn't thought about that. So scattered site housing comes up again and again. Again, this is their website, but this is what they file in briefs, too. So you got to pay attention to it. So this is DII versus Patterson. It was a case filed by the New York P&A, actually by one, a subcontractor. Uh, so that's our you know, peer office. Uh, I had the good fortune of working with Tim Clune and Cliff Zucker, who, who worked on the case as they went to the Second Circuit on some procedural issues, and, and we worked together on their briefing. Um, they, won, uh, they won in the district court, in the trial court, but they, and they went to the Second Circuit on this technical thing about whether they actually could bring the case or not, whether they had standing is the term. Um, but by then, the, just, the Justice Department had intervened, and they'd already started supplying briefing to the court and, and findings of fact that they thought the court should, should um, adopt. So if you want to know what the Department of Justice looks like in, a, in an Olmstead case, go look at the, the, um, the findings of fact that they recommended to the trial court and the remedial plan that they recommended to the trial court, because that's pretty much what they're saying and what they're going to continue to do. After the case was reversed on appeal, they reached a settlement that essentially incorporated all the things that DOJ wanted. So this is a really dense slide, but when you get a ch come back and look at it. This is where my table thing fell apart, because there was supposed to be a slide with Olmstead and DOJ and the CMS reg, and it was going to show you where all those things line up. You see a table there? I don't either. Um, but, but what's there, and if you look at it and you think about it along the lines of what we've been talking about, uh, many of the same elements. Had two whole slides, and they wanted to make it four. I said, I don't know how to do that. Here's the final settlement. Individuals with ser serious mental illness who reside in large, privately owned adult homes. Now, adult homes in New York are uh, big nursing homes. They're not like what we talk about as adult homes here. They're not small uh, foster home kind of things. They're, they're big nursing homes, and it's huge business. It's millions of dollars. So this was a big deal case. And these were people who were deinstitutionalized from the state psychiatric hospitals, and they were put in these large private nursing homes, and they were very segregated and very discriminated against as a result. Um, live, work, participate fully in community life. You can, you can read that. It's all the same elements we've been talking about. No campuses, scattered site. That's the key thing to this. So let's talk about the definition of community. Nancy talked about the rule is in a structural way and how you guys are going to have to implement it, and I know, I, was, I thought that was Fascinating, because I, I know there are a lot of you out there that are doing really amazing work on the ground with some limited resources, and that a lot of folks are engaged in designing their own plans and, and making sure that their lives are very full. And we're going to the People First conference and seeing all the county workers who are there with the, with the, the advocates and, and the, the bond and the friendship between those folks, and you can just tell, and the, and the staffers from the waivers. Uh, you can just tell there's a lot of really cool stuff going on on the ground. And so uh, nobody's saying that that's not going to have to, that shouldn't continue. And, and what I hear Nancy saying is, you guys are a pilot. You guys are the energy that's going to drive this conversation as, as CMS forces it down farther and farther to the level of the individual, talking about the individual and what they want. So uh, it's very exciting to be involved in that, even if it's at a conference where I just get to hang out with folks. Um, so this is a real quick overview, opportunities to seek employment and work in commit competitive integrated settings, engage in community life, control personal resources, receive services in the community. Uh, here we go again, to the same degree of access as individuals not receiving HCBS, in other words, individuals who are not disabled. Thank you, Justice Kennedy. We think, rumor has it, people at Justice helped to write this. Now, my own view is that CMS doesn't talk to anybody, and it's really hard to get access. Nancy Grease, yes. So I'm thinking maybe CMS is just paying attention for a change. So we'll see. And, and all of the concerns that she raised are absolutely critical. I mean, we can't do this without structure, and we can't do this without outcomes, and we all have to have a vision about how it should work. I'm not sure I agree they're as soft as you think they are, but that may be from the experience of seeing them implemented in litigation. So, so it's got to come from the ground, though. You're absolutely right about that. So here, you know, selected by the individual from among setting options. Options are identified and documented. 
And I get the billing part. That's really hard. Some of this stuff's going to be really hard to come up with billing structures for. One of the things about being an executive director of a nonprofit is I suddenly understand accounting. Who knew? It's hard. But you can learn it. Ensures the individual's right of privacy, dignity, and respect, freedom from coercion and restraint, facilitates, facilitates individual choice regarding services, supports, and who provides them. Now, some of this is interesting because it's coming from the aging community, which has suddenly decided they, they love person-centered planning. And, and our own uh, Bonnie Cantor, uh, who's the head of aging, is a big, big part of that movement. They, they think elders should do person-centered planning to the extent they're capable of doing that. Um, so... So some of this is being driven by the elder community, which has suddenly discovered with a zealot's passion stuff that we've been doing in DD for 20 years, since, you know, Nerney and those guys. Or Wolfensburg, if you remember him. Optimizes but, did not regiment, but does not regiment individual initiative, autonomy, and independence in making life choices, including but not limited to daily activities, physical environment, and with whom to interact. Footnote. Nancy was talking about climate change. My argument about climate change is why don't we want clean air? My, my argument about community is I don't want to live in a dorm. I, don't, I hated living in a barracks when I was in the Navy. I got, you know, I got family members who rubber band back in and out of my house, my kids. I got a granddaughter, three-month-old granddaughter living with me right now. That's with the bags under my eyes. So, so really, it's like let's get clean air and let's live like everybody lives. You have your own house, you have your own friends, you pick your own roommates, you pick your own food. Those, to me, that's just a common sense argument, but obviously it's much more complex than that. And we have some things that are not community. Um, the first bullet is essentially don't do a campus. You cannot do a campus with a waiver, period. End of discussion, don't try it. That's important because we're going to come back to that. Any other setting that has the effect of isolating individuals within the broader community will be presumed, and you can rebut the presumption, lawyers get that, you know, presumed rebutting presumptions, that's what we do. Um, nothing's ever concrete, you can always rebut the presumption somehow. But you've got to show it. And Ohio's at a disadvantage there in some ways because, um, well, this is kind of taking it up a level. You know, somebody asked us the other day for a copy of Ohio's state plan, state Medicaid plan. Ohio doesn't have a single document that is their state Medicaid plan. They'll say, oh, it's in the administrative code, or it's in the waiver application. It's just this compendium of other things. So, so um, how CMS is going to react to that and, and look at how, how Ohio does things in its Medicaid program, I think John McCarthy is very interesting, a guy very interested in modernizing Ohio's Medicaid, but he's got lots of fights in the legislature to do that. The legislature likes having control of it. So uh, the joint Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid, Senate committee, I, I, not a detailed person, as you can tell. Uh, Susan Ackerman, who was at Budget Management and has been at Community Solutions and is with the Ohio Health Plans for a while, is going to be the executive director of that committee, and I think she's a great choice for that. She understands health care and Medicaid and in this state better than anyone. So what is not, it's a pretty straightforward list. It's not an ICFDD. It's not a nursing facility. One of the things that we're, we're, we're going to commit a comment on the PASAR rules that are out, um, we're really shocked by the number of people with DD in nursing homes right now. That, we thought we were done with that. Um, apparently it's sort of the last resort where some people put their family member because they can't find anything else and they can't get on a waiver. Pretty shocking, the numbers, and they're going up. So we're looking at that really hard. Employment's the other area that people are nervous about, and we've already heard some about that. Lanes versus Kitzhaber is the case out of Oregon that our sister uh, agency out there, a Disability Rights Oregon, filed. Um, and the DOJ, which is the theme here, moved to intervene and said, we think that the ADA integration mandate doesn't just apply to residential, which is what the state org argued, because Olmstead's about residential. And the district court agreed. So for the first time, a, a federal district court has said it applies to all state programs, not just residential programs. So coming back to Ohio, uh, we looked at the Braddock numbers in 2111. The waivers have grown. The waivers have grown, no question. Uh, and, and the counties have been in the forefront of that because if you don't have county match, you can't grow the waiver. Um, but we still had, at that time, 9,600 people living in significantly segregated institutional placements. 
6,755 in ICFs or NIFs, or greater, 16 or greater, and over 2,800 in ICFs of 7 to 15. 28% live in an institutional setting. So I said to my team, go out and find out what's going on out there. And this is the part where it gets to be fun. Uh, Adana, Kevin Truitt, uh, Allison McKay uh, were hit the ground. We, were part, we are partnered with Sam Bagenstoss, who used to be at Justice and now teaches at Michigan Law. We're also partnered with the Center for Public Representation, Kathy Costanza, Sam Miller, who are also counsel on the Lane case. And so they've been going around and they've reviewed thousands of documents, which Kate Heller was kind enough to provide us from DODD, and um, visited 10 ICFs for six day and vocational programs. And I skipped over the next one because it's like, in DD we talk about people being their own guardian, which is kind of like, it's a retromoron. It's what I, the term retromoron. I have a, uh, an, an, an analog watch which used to be just a watch, but when we had digital watches, then we had to come up with a descriptor for this. So this is an analog watch, that's a retro moron, because we had to go back to something older and name it. So in DD, we have a person who is his own guardian. Well, we're all our own guardians, of course. It's, it's the norm, it's the standard, it's the presumption. And here we now have waiver homes. So what is a waiver home? It's a home that someone else has bought and that a provider has put three or four usually four individuals in. And sometimes they're owned by the county, sometimes they're owned by a private company. Um, it's really been, housing's been a problem, so, so using the state capital budget to buy county funded, to, use, to get it out to the counties to buy housing, to put people on waivers into the homes has been a solution. Uh, but like many solutions, it creates its own problems. How many of you saw the turkey farm video out of Iowa? Raise your hand if you saw it. This was a pretty horrible situation, and it was, a, it was a national scandal a few years ago. Actually got Social Security interested in how people do rep payee work. And so now we have a program where we send people out to evaluate whether the rep payees are actually following the rules, uh, and that's from Social Security. That program, that turkey farm, got an award from the National Arc in 1984 because it actually had people working in the community. It was a 14C program, but they were working on that farm. Well, by 1990, 19, 2000, there was serious abuse, there was exploitation, the men were locked in the barracks, there were lots of problems. So things that are great ideas in one generation end up kind of getting stuck. So you gotta keep thinking, you gotta be vital, you gotta be nimble in your thinking. Vision is so important. So our team went out and they spent a lot of time on the road and they talked to a lot of people, and we're still talking. Uh, we have some stakeholder meetings next week. There are about 6,000 individuals who are institutionalized in private ICFs, IDD, and approximately another 1,000 in the developmental centers. We have 10 developmental centers still. We'll talk more about those in a second. Many of these feel they have no freedom, no opportunities to maintain relationships with people outside the facility and feel isolated and depressed. There's that mental health component again. Their lives are regimented, they eat and sleep according to the facility's schedule and activities and outings to the community when they occur are chosen by the facility staff and occur only with other residents and staff. Some describe life in an institution as prison or solitary confinement. No other state has more beds, more large ICFs as Ohio, we're number one. The national trend reflects a 33% decrease in the number of people living in large ICFs, but Ohio's experienced an increase of 6%, and I already mentioned the NIFs. So even as we've had waiver growth, and there's no question we have waiver growth, it's, it's two tracks, we're missing something. They're not connecting. What struck our staff and what they were amazed by was how segregated the people in the waiver homes were. Partly because of how they were, they, they were employed in segregated workshops, um, partly because nobody thought about a person-centered plan that actually wanted to find found out what they wanted to do. They were really, st and I was surprised by that. I thought, oh yeah, waivers are working, that's cool. They're out there in the counties, they're going to the fair and doing all that cool stuff. It's not, hap not, not in a lot of places. So we were really surprised by that. Waivers, a delicate talk, pop topic. I'll just try to stay factual. The most recent expansion of the HCBS in Ohio was the self-waiver. It's a great idea. It has, you, you manage your own money. 
It has an employment component. That's great. We've got brokers out there managing money. It's a very small waiver. It's got caps. Everybody loves these caps. We'll talk about that in a second. Caps make it predictable, affordable, accounting. You've got to know what your costs are going to be, it's particularly when you're using levy dollars, county match, to pay the match. Level one's got a small cap, 5,000. We always thought the level one was basically to get the person who's living in their parents' home a Medicaid card. That's the best thing about the level one waiver is you don't deem the income anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. So, so you got a cap there. The IO waiver, now you got to remember we're talking about a waiver system that was really, the last time it was thought about in a hard way was like 1986, early 1990s. We had the level one, the level two, and the level three. That's how we were going to fix the system. The level one was just a small ball waiver just for people who needed some Medicaid and some help. The level two, which became the IO waiver, was a workhorse waiver, but it was capped at about $130,000. The level three was for people who had really intensive needs. You get some nursing, you do some other things. Well, we never did the level three. So the level two, the IO waiver, has become the go-to waiver for everything. And it's expensive, and it's not individually capped. So it, it's, it's tough, because you can go, the costs can go up significantly. At the same time, the way that it's been implemented, it has maintained or exceeded cost neutrality. In other words, you, your HCBS waiver cannot cost you more than the institution it's supposed to replace. So your average daily cost for the waiver can't exceed the average daily cost for an ICF or annual cost. You can annualize it. And in the last waiver application on the IO waiver, the projected cost for the, for, this is all Medicaid costs for year five of the waiver, for the, for the waiver was 69,683. The, for ICFs, it was 142,761. So, and then this is averaging we're talking about. So you could theoretically have somebody with really high needs on the IO waiver and still not exceed cost neutrality. Uh, but you have to have more waivers and you have to have more people on it to make that happen. So it's not being fully utilized. Our concern all along has been that these other waivers would be more attractive to the folks that are now being served. And so instead of doing an IO waiver, the counties would use their match to do the self or the level one. And we're seeing some evidence of that. This is more anecdotal cases that we've done. We get a lot of complaints about the waivers. We get a lot of complaints about some counties. We don't hear from some counties, and we hear some counties are doing it really well. But there's tensions around the DDP and prior authorization. Now, um, prior authorization was, and the, the DDP was the state's response to CMS saying you can't put a cap on the IO waiver, an individual cap. And so the state said, okay, fine, we'll just fix how we provide, how we do the service plan. And they created the DDP. And the Fed said, okay, that's fine, but you've got to have prior authorizations as a safety valve. Basically, if you've got somebody with higher needs, um, they, they should go through prior authorization and you should approve it that way. That way you can manage your costs. It's utilization review. We get that. It's costing us money too. What's happened in the cases that we see is that prior authorization doesn't happen, that it's being used as a cost containment mechanism. In other words, that it's in, in some cases, it ends up being like an individual cap instead of the prior auth being used to make sure the person gets necessary service. And the burden is falling on the families. We're seeing a lot of cases come through from counties where they're saying, oh, you have to do natural supports. Uh, you know, you, you can quit your job. In, not, you know, we've had cases where they say, you can quit your job and stay home with your kid. Or you work at home, so you can take care of your kid while you're working. Those are extreme examples, but we've had those actual cases. So there's those internal pressures. We also see cases where the county has put the person in an ICF because it doesn't cost them anything. They don't have to come up with a waiver. Lack of planning and commitment at the state level to expand waivers, although they're still supporting the 1500 Nancy Martin waivers, for which we're very grateful. They didn't have to do it after a certain number of years. Uh, that court order has expired. So there's still the 1500, there's 200 DC transition waivers, there's a couple of other things. We, we like to believe that somebody over at the department has a bunch of state matched waivers in the, the, their desk drawer because they are the last resort. And, and things, the way the law works, somebody has to make sure that that person who's eligible for a waiver where there's a slot available technically um, has to get the waiver. And so we've litigated in, in the administrative sense some of those cases and suddenly, magically, a, a waiver will appear. Hey, that's pretty cool. 
Another problem with waivers is lack of statewideness based on the local funding model. Right now, a major waiver growth is only coming from the counties. So only the counties that seek new waivers get new waivers. Now, the state's being very facilitative about that. They'll write a letter to CMS and say, we want to increase the slots on the I.O. waiver by X number because Cuyahoga County or Hamilton County or Franklin County wants to build, have more waivers. Uh, but what we get is these disparities, these state these disparities from county to county. Franklin, these are 2012 numbers. Um, Franklin had 2677. Uh, an I.O., Monroe County had one, uh, level one, Cuyahoga had 1546, Ashtabula had four. Uh, we know those counties have needs. We know there are people in that county that have needs. We talk to them. We hear their complaints. So a lot of times we tell them there's not much we can do about it because your county doesn't have any waivers. Um, the transitions waiver is interesting. They closed it. They're not letting anybody else on it. Um, we had to threaten them to um, make sure that everybody who was supposed to transition actually did transition. CMS came in at our request and told them they had to do that. Um, that's important because it has some nursing services and some other things that the IO doesn't have. So for people with medical needs, a lot of people in the ICFs you hear, oh, they have medical needs. Well, right now the IO waiver doesn't have really rich medical supports. So, uh, and we're only seeing access to waivers primarily in emergency situations. It's really hard to get somebody into a waiver unless they have what a technical definition of an emergency. They're about to lose their placement. They have a family member who dies. Their supports are gone. So again, these are our experiences and the things we found when we went out into the community. Waitlist. If you haven't looked at this document, I encourage you to do so. Carolyn Knight and DD Council funded it. Yeah. <laughs> Who's from Council? Yeah. All right. It's one of our sister federal funded agencies under the DD Act. Um, this is a great piece of work. It's fascinating. There's some weaknesses, but, but Barry, um, uh, who, the guy who's, who did the survey uh, up at the Government Resource Center, quickly acknowledged that and would love to do more work. Um, the study shows that there are over 40,000 people waitlisted. The median wait time for the IL waiver is 9.3 years. They extrapolate from the, 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 they ask people, this is interesting about the opt-out kind of thing. They said, what needs do you have right now? And then said, what needs will you have in the future? And of course, a lot of people don't know what their needs are, or they, they don't know that tomorrow they're going to get sick, or tomorrow they're, 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 they're not going to have their residence anymore. So, but it's, it's a start, you know? So based on the needs that were identified, the immediate needs that were identified, they, they extrapolated that 87,100, sorry, 8,700 plus need a level one waiver right now. 10,000 plus need an IO waiver right now. Future need, we go to the aging population, both the caregivers and the people receiving services. Over 5,000 will need a level one, over 27,000 in the next five years will need an I.O. waiver or be institutionalized or not get adequate care. That's essentially what they're finding. The sample was small. That's by their own admission. There were a few self-advocates. They were disappointed that they didn't get more people talking about their own needs. Mostly it's family members, but that's typical of how these things go. Again, it's a good first cut. And the other thing is that they had a really small number of people in ICFs. And the reason for that was, among other things, that a few years ago, the state had, a diff had two different waiting lists, one for people who didn't have residential services and one for people who did. And in the course of that, they moved all the people who, did, who were in ICFs, or a lot of them anyway, off of the, uh, the waiver wait list onto a supported services list, or some, I forget the exact name, but something like that. So when the wait list the current wait list has a lot of folks who have come back on, and I know some people, some guardians, have put folks on their wait on the, the wait list out of their ICF, out of ICS. But a lot of those folks got moved off and never got moved back on. So when you start to look at the wait list, you're automatically looking at a community-based population. Employment and day services. This is what our team found, looking at the data and going out and looking at places. 93% are in sheltered work or enclaves. 17,000 people receive services in sheltered workshop. Nearly all funding is for day hab, for day hab is in congregate facility-based services. Uh, 14,000 people receiving services are in congregate facility-based settings. The ICFs are really driving this problem. Uh, I know you guys, the county boards, have really taken leadership in supported employment and I applaud you for that. 
We actually have folks working in our office that we get from Franklin County's program and we love them and we want to make it work for them. Uh, we, we do a lot of that. We, do, we want to make sure we are walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Um, the ICFs a few years ago got into a huge argument about why should they be paying the, the, the DD boards for day services, which was the prevalent model at that time. And they took their money and they went back home and they started their own day programs and you all know this. And we looked at it as a litigation option and we helped a few people stay in their day programs, but frankly, a lot of folks moved out of what, even though it was a segregated setting, was more integrated because it took them out of their home, out of their single provider, into the, to the board setting. There were a lot of things that you guys did with them that were very positive. Now they go to Dayhab that's paid for, that's owned by the same provider as the residential provider. That's, that's one of the most segregating things we saw when we went out. Future planning. Problems with future planning, maybe. I'll, I'm going to speed this up because you guys never stand between an audience and lunch. Rule number one. <laughs> Six to eight bed ICFs are being developed with a public-private partnership for people who leave state-operated DCs and other ICFs. We have asked and asked and asked for this not to happen. We think it's a waste of money. We think it's going to end up, th these are going to be segregated placements by any definition, and so all they're doing is throwing good money after bad. Uh, these people mostly could be served on waivers. I would say they could all be served on waivers. I'm not a professional, but that's not even part of the conversation. They clearly lack areas in the areas of personal choice and independent. There's no mandate currently for people being moved from ICFs to waiver. It's all, there's some, some incentives and there's lots of partnership conversations, but there's no mandate. The DC reductions are incremental and the DD system is not reinvesting those dollars in the community. They have not been able to recoup those dollars as they save them. The reductions waiver only address individual and state oper operated ICFs, although we do see the monkey move up where somebody moves out of a DC into a private ICF and that person in the private ICF goes to a waiver, which is, seems to me unnecessary duplicative, but at least it gets some movement. So here's the conclusion. Some of this is, I'll try to be clear when, when it's just me, um, but a lot of this is stuff we've been saying. This shouldn't shock anybody. Um, we found that the system was more segregated than we thought it could be. It was segregated even in waiver homes. It was segregated even in places where we thought there would be more integration. Uh, so, so we were shocked by that. We, we, it made us really step back and rethink, what are we doing here? Um, clearly, there are systemic violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Olmstead and community integration. The state must plan for and commit resources to a service system that allows individuals to be served in the most integrated setting appropriate to their needs, as defined by that person. That's a really key point that Nancy was making. The waiver match should be paid for by the state, ensuring equal access to services statewide and more, thank you. There's actually a number on that. It's $336 million in 2014. It's very doable. What you guys do with the lovey money, now that's the tricky part. You gotta be responsible. You gotta show that you're using it for something that really needs to be done. And I get that it makes it, you know, that's, a, that, that's gonna interplay with your levies. And I, I, trust me, I understand raising money. I do it all the time. It's hard. But that's that la they have to capture that match and get it back up to the state level. Reimbursement rates must be revised, and we joined up. We are joined by this uh, uh, on the, by the ARC, by APSI, by everybody involved in the in this system. Reimbursement rates must be revised so that qualified staff can be recruited, trained, and retained. The biggest problem, thank you. The biggest problem we have right now is that when the minimum wage goes up, it busts our waiver programs. That's not right. The turnover, when you hear from the parents that the, the person didn't show, I had to miss work because my person didn't show. Well, that person's making seven bucks an hour. They probably went to work for Walmart. The community system should ensure that the individual's not isolated, that there are routine interactions with others, not just staff. And this isn't just some visionary thing. This is what ensures the person's safety. Lots of eyes on. You cannot, de you cannot de segregate an institutional population unless you make sure that on the back side of that, on the integration side, people are safe, that they are, in, they, they are in their communities, that there are eyes on them, and that they are not hurt. This would not be a fundamental alteration of Ohio's system. Ohio doesn't have a comprehensive plan. Ohio doesn't move people off the wait list at a reasonable rate. Read the study. Current waiver expenditures are far below the cost neutrality principle required by CMS. 
in talking with people who understand f Medicaid funding and what, how much money is in this system. You know, the, the legislature gets tired of the DD system coming over and asking for money because there's a lot of money in this system. So Nancy's notion that you got to move away from models that, promulgate, that, that, that continue this 24-hour care model like ICFs to models that recognize people have different aspects of their lives and it paid, it's paid for in different ways, critically important. We have the money to do this without significant new uh, appropriations, but we just have to do it the right way. This is a quote, some of you have heard Martin Luther King's quote about the arc of justice. He, like a good preacher as he was, he borrowed liberally from his predecessors. Theodore Parker was an abolitionist in the pre-Civil War days. Uh, he, he unfortunately died before the Emancipation Proclamation. He never saw that happen, but he was an ardent abolitionist. And his quote is a little fuller, and I, I like it. Um, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I can calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience, but from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. And I know the work you do, and I know how much you care about this population, and I know about your vision on the ground, in the community, and, and you, you all see the arc bend towards justice. Thank you very much.